Dr. Lisa Milnichuk is going to be our honored speaker today. And uh, thanks uh, for folks who are joining us uh, both in the room as well as uh, virtually for this uh, particular session. And uh, also just the folks who already know that if we have questions in the room, please use the mics there and so that we can see um, who is actually posing the question. And so uh, Lisa can, uh, can respond to you uh, directly, but also those uh, on uh, virtual platform can also see you as well. And those uh, who are joining us virtually, make sure that you can use the Q&A feature and uh, to pose your questions. And uh, so uh, it's absolutely uh, delighted that we have Dr. Milnichuk here today. She's a director of the Advanced Heart Failure and the Heart Disease Program at the Ottawa Heart Institute and a professor of medicine and uh, also Department of uh, Cellular and Molecular Medicine at University of Ottawa, and she completed her medical degree at McMaster University and uh, subsequent internal medicine at Queens and the cardiology fellowship at University of Ottawa Heart Institute. Then she subsequently went uh, to complete a fellowship in advanced heart failure and cardiac transplantation at Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston with uh, Dr. Lynn Warner Stevenson, right? Yeah, so who's a uh, I think a real icon in the field. And she concurrently also completed a master's degree in clinical science and epidemiology at the Harvard School of uh, Public Health. And uh, Lisa really has her passion in uh, pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure uh, from the bench to the bedside and today onto the platform too. And uh, she's a translational scientist, uh, holds uh, the uh, University of Ottawa chair uh, in heart function research and uh, which is a great honor and to build a really multidisciplinary research program at uh, the uh, University of Ottawa. And uh, she has uh, also a number of uh, major leadership roles and at, uh, at the Core Health uh, Ontario Senior Leadership for Cardiac Diseases, as well as expert panel for Cadiz and Health Quality Ontario. My God, you really actually hold a lot of power here. Yeah, she's been a Canadian Cardiovascular Society Council member since 2015 and then she's a uh, uh, current uh, secretary and treasurer, so she has all the money too. And uh, so she's uh, also being appointed vice chair of patient safety and clinical care for the Department of Medicine at University of Ottawa. Now translating her research is co-founder and director of pulmonary hypertension program and developed a rapid intervention clinic for heart failure patients, a regional heart failure program, which is uh, really actually, I think, uh, a parent paragon and the paradigm, you know, in terms of how uh, heart failure can be best cared for uh, in uh, really actually a multidisciplinary setting. And uh, also provincially and nationally, she's an active leader for heart failure and pulmonary hypertension community, serving as a vice chair on the Pulmonary Hypertension Association of Canada. And also she co-led the uh, pulmonary hypertension guidelines. And there's also uh, the right heart failure platform for the Canadian Heart Function Alliance, right? You know, so I think this is uh, super uh, exciting. And uh, so uh, so she really actually is uh, a fantastic uh, researcher, lots of uh, publication, but uh, importantly, you know, a number of fellows were now leading their programs, you know, around the world is really an exceptional tribute to Lisa's uh, mentorship. And so we really look forward to uh, uh, her presentation today um, entitled Understanding Right Heart Failure from a bench to a platform. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, very detailed introduction. Uh, and uh, thanks so much uh, for uh, listening to me for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about right heart failure. Those are my conflicts. Um, we can't discuss about right heart failure unless we mention pulmonary hypertension. And we'll really talk about the two in an intertwined way that I think will be clear as to why we do that. Um, pulmonary hypertension is not actually a rare disease. In fact, it's very common. It's not a single disease. It's a classification of diseases with an estimated prevalence of about 1% globally. But if you look in the cohort of patients over the age of 65, the prevalence is estimated up to 10%. And a lot of that is pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease. Now, there are many different causes of pulmonary hypertension, but ultimately, for many, if not all of these patients, the most common determinant of survival or outcome is right heart failure. And we know that pulmonary arterial hypertension or group one disease is a progressive disease. There's vascular remodeling, often long before patients have any degree of symptoms, endothelial dysfunction, intimal medial proliferation, hypertrophy, vascular stiffness, and thrombosis continue until the patients develop what we know, of course, is the advanced plexiform lesions, uh, classic for PAH, that obliterate the vascular lumen. 
Now, in fact, it's not the severity of that vascular remodeling that determines prognosis in pulmonary arterial hypertension. It's ultimately the degree of adaptation of the right ventricle, and the most common cause of death for our patients is right heart failure. But it's also understood that there's heterogeneity in the development of right heart failure with PAH. These are two patients of mine with the exact same subtype of PAH with the exact same pulmonary artery pressures. And yet one patient has relatively preserved RV function with little right heart failure. And the other patient, unfortunately, develops progressive abnormal remodeling right heart failure and unfortunately an untimely death. And so over the next 40 minutes or so, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about some of the potential mechanisms that contribute to this maladaptive phenotype or maladaptive remodeling in the progression of right heart failure. We're going to focus uh, primarily on metabolic changes and neurohormonal changes, things that I've been interested in in my research. And then we'll talk a little bit about the landscape of how we treat pulmonary arterial hypertension and right heart failure clinically, some of the strengths, some of the limitations. And I'll introduce um, what we're hoping to be a novel strategy for the next wave of research in pulmonary in, in right heart failure. So what happens in the setting of right heart failure as far as the ventricle is concerned? Well, hopefully and ideally, the right ventricle can increase its contractility and cardiac output to maintain uh, forward flow and perfusion. And there's adequate coupling between right ventricular function and pulmonary arterial resistance. But unfortunately, this doesn't happen very often. And as the uh, degree of RV afterload increases, um, contractility of the right ventricle has to increase further. And it does so, of course, at the uh, cost of the RV diastolic function. While stress continues to increase, and in those predisposed to a maladaptive phenotype, you eventually see a disconnect where the RV can no longer compensate by increasing contractility. While stress ensues, the RV dilates, and the patients develop this maladaptive remodeling and clinical right heart failure this maladaptive phenotype in RV failure? Well, we know that in fact, it's actually very complicated and it's contributed by um, me me mechanisms such as inflammation, apoptosis, uh, ischemia, capillary rarefaction, and importantly, a change in substrate utilization or a change in metabolism. And how do we identify someone predisposed to a maladaptive phenotype, or how do we recognize a phenotype when it occurs? And there's lots of different clinical and echo parameters that help us to do this. This one very nice study just looked very simply at right heart and systolic remodeling index and shown that it absolutely can stratify prognosis in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. But what the investigators did is that they actually incorporated this echo parameter into other risk models, and they showed that you could distinguish between different levels of compensation of right heart failure and improve your ability to predict death. What they did further then is to look deeper and see whether or not they could identify a proteomic footprint of this maladaptive remodeling. And what they did is they looked at different scores, the Mayo Clinic score and the right heart score of maladaptive remodeling that incorporates this RV strain as well as functional class and BNP, three simple parameters. And they show, demonstrated that high levels of hepatocyte growth factor, stem cell growth factor, and stromo-derived factor one were associated with worse prognosis in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, independent of their pulmonary pressures. They confirmed this in a validation cohort and also in myocyte tissue and in animal models, really opening the door for new markers of maladaption. Now, metabolic profile, profiling has also been recently used to try to identify these footprints of this maladaptive phenotype. And this is a small study of 117 PAH patients, but they used a partial least squares discriminant analysis method, and they showed cluster differentiation between RV, dilated RV and non-dilated RV between survivors and non-survivors across a range of functional ca capacity and six-minute walk test. And then they also looked at patients who had a maladaptive phenotype and they standardized them or, or referenced them against patients who didn't all with similar pulmonary pressures. And interestingly, they demonstrated polyamine pathway, histidine pathway, and sphingomyelins to be particularly associated with this ma maladaptive phenotype. And these uh, markers play critical roles in oxidative balance. They contribute to cell growth. They're involved with cell proliferation and survival. 
whether these pathways um, represent an adaptive response or failure of an adaptive response remains to be seen. But again, uh, important and exciting um, evidence that might support new markers in this transition to a maladaptive phenotype. Coming back to metabolism, we know that decades of work have supported this sort of causative link between metabolic reprogramming and the development of pH and right heart failure. And in fact, many foundational studies have really demonstrated this mechanism of increased glycolysis, diminished glucose oxidation, not just in pulmonary vascular or pulmonary smooth muscle, artery smooth muscle cells, but also in the RV. And these changes parallel what we see in cancer cells. And this hyperpolarized mechanism membrane potential that we see in these cells contributes to a resistance to apoptosis. So this is sort of this uh, oncogenic phenotype of pulmonary vascular cells and right heart cells. And this molecular footprint that's associated with this transition from a compensated to a decompensated right ventricle has really been well described. And it's associated with a sharp rise in mitochondrial reaction, reactive oxygen species, inhibition of HIF-1 alpha, activation of P53, and this subsequent shift to a glycogenic phenotype, and importantly, downstream, a reduction in angiogenesis and markers of angiogenic factors. So if there is metabolic substrate change in the decompensation of a right of a RVH, ischemia is probably an important driver. And SPECT imaging studies have shown very nicely how there can be perfusion abnormalities in the right heart in patients with pulmonary hypertension who have normal coronaries. And we all know that there's an inverse relationship between right coronary perfusion um, and the severity of pulmonary hypertension but it's probably more than just ischemia that drives a maladaptive phenotype. We also see capillary rarefaction. Now, this is an animal study that looked at two models of pulmonary hypertension, monocrotaline and PA banding, and they demonstrated very nicely that um, this was associated with decreased capillary density and a decreased expression of RV VEGF and alpha mRNA. And in fact, they had a small number of, uh, of RV tissue samples from PAH patients, and they demonstrated reduced capillary density relative to normal patients, particularly in patients who had scleroderma. So ischemia may be an important driver of the downstream substrate utilization. And our group has, and others have nicely shown some of these metabolic changes in our clinical patients with pulmonary hypertension. We've shown that FDG uptake, a surrogate of increased glucose uptake, likely from glycolysis, is related to the severity of pulmonary hypertension and also to the severity of RV dysfunction. We've also been able to look at fatty acid utilization in the right ventricle um, in patients with pulmonary hypertension with the marker probe FTHA. And again, we showed that as the RV starts to fail, FTHA uptake increases, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. But in a very qualitative, qualitative way, we looked at the relationship between perfusion and FDG metabolism, sort of a mismatch of RV perfusion to FDG. And in all patients in our cohort who had severe pulmonary hypertension, they were all associated with significant perfusion defects with the, most, um, the highest level of FDG uptake. So clearly supporting this idea that there is a relationship between perfusion and subsequent metabolic reprogramming. But it's not even the right ventricle that has this metabolic reprogramming. We've also demonstrated that you can see FDG uptake in the right atrium of patients with PAH, and it correlates directly with the right atrial pressures. And then more recently, we looked at FDG uptake in the lungs of our patients with pulmonary hypertension, and we showed that there was differences in FDG uptake between normal controls patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension who would be more likely to have this sort of glycolytic change and patients with pH in left heart disease in which the pulmonary hypertension is more thought to be for many patients passive venous congestion. Now, obviously, um, lung uptake cannot distinguish between parenchymal and vascular uptake, but it is certainly a nice and early suggestion of the role of PET imaging, perhaps in not only understanding mechanisms of disease or subtypes of disease, but potentially in serving as a role for treatment response. 
ultimately, we know that FTG uptake has prognostic value. And we and other groups have shown this, that in patients whose FTG uptake in the right ventricle fails to regress with treatment, they're also more likely to have a lack of clinical response to other important parameters that predict prognosis. So FTG PET imaging can help us to understand not just mechanisms of disease, but may be a role to monitor treatment in the right heart as well. But ultimately, the gains in understanding these metabolic pathways in maladaptive RV remodeling allow for opportunity for potential therapeutic targets. And that's really what it's all about. Now, one way, to, one way to capitalize on this, of course, is uh, to exploit the Randall cycle, right? This reciprocal mutually inhibitory relationship between glucose oxidation and fatty acid oxidation, such that increases of one result in a downstream decrease in the other. And this can be done and manipulated with things like di drugs like dichloral acetate, which actually um, inhibits um, the, um, uh, the PDK inhibition of uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase. And you can also do this with fatty acid oxidation inhibitors, which then will shut down the FAO oxidation shutdown of glucose oxidation. And we've shown in early work, we've shown just treatment of pulmonary hypertension with drugs like macitentin, a standard therapy in pulmonary arterial hypertension in this animal model can actually be sensitive. FDG PET imaging can be sensitive to these changes. And with treatment of these animals, we showed uh, improvements in RV FDG uptake as well as correlations between FDG uptake and improvements in right heart function and pulmonary hypertension. But Dr. Michalakis in his work has taken this even to a greater extent and looked at the role of metabolic modulation, both experimentally and in early clinical studies. And in this um, animal model of monocrotaline, he demonstrated that the monocrotaline induced pulmonary hypertension was associated with increased GLUT1 expression, PDH phosphorylation, um, all expected when you have this sort of glycolytic phenotype. And when you treat these animals with dichloral acetate and you switch them over to glucose oxidation, he was able to demonstrate a reduction in pulmonary hypertension severity, an improvement in cardiac output, and a decrease in RV size. And we've also looked at metabolic modulation in experimental models. And this was work done by Ali Amadi, my postdoc student from a few years ago. And he looked very nicely at two models of pulmonary hypertension, the Sujin hypoxia model and the PA banding model. We gave these animals um, a melono -CO coa decarboxylase inhibitor to turn off fatty acid oxidation. Now, in both models, we, we demonstrated significant pulmonary hypertension. And when we treated these animals, we saw a a reduction in the pulmonary hypertension in the Sujin hypoxia model, which we were hoping to see a vascular effect, but no effect as you wouldn't expect in a banding model. We were able to use in vivo PET imaging to understand these metabolic shifts. And again, we saw that, that uh, MCD inhibitor, inhibitor treatment was associated with a significant decrease in fatty acid uptake in the RV for both the Sujin hypoxia and in the PA banding models. And there was some shifts with decreases in FDG uptake as well, likely reflecting less glycolysis. Now, this treatment was associated with improvements in RV function in both models, again, suggesting a Per, a direct effect in the RV in the banding model and improvement in ATP production uh, from cleaved myocytes. And this work is supported by uh, further by some ex vivo work and in other investigators that looked at a different uh, drug to turn off fatty acid oxidation, trimetazidine, and they demonstrated that in their um, working heart models that uh, pulmonary artery banding was associated with a glycolytic phenotype, and they were able to turn that off, improve uh, glucose oxidation, and improve RV size uh, by giving a fatty acid oxidation inhibitor. And the early clinical translation of this is in progress. This is one very small study of uh, 11 patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, and they demonstrated that renolazine, another drug which can turn off fatty acid oxidation, was associated with a trend but not significant for improved exercise capacity and some improvement in RV models of remodeling. <laughs> 
And this comes back to Dr. Michalakis's translational work with dichloral acetate, a drug, by the way, that's being used uh, in cancer treatment. And in his, this prospective cohort of PAH patients, he demonstrated a generally mixed effect of dichloral acetate on pulmonary pressures and RV function, but he, he demonstrated really nicely a, a, a heterogeneous effect. And that if you had a UCP2 or CERT3 polymorphisms, genes that are associated with metabolic, um, metabolic syndrome, and also um, genes that create um, in, uh, independent inhibition of PDH out outside of PDK, you would expect people with these genetic uh, uh, differences would be less likely to respond to dichloral acetate. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. Individuals who were so homozygous for this trait had absolutely no response to dichloral acetate. And there was a substantial response in those that did. Again, this sort of suggests that metabolic reprogramming may be a tool for treatment in right heart failure and pulmonary hypertension, but also the importance of personalizing the therapies. And so a lot of people are very interested in this work, and there's a number of ongoing small studies looking at fatty acid oxidation inhibitors, metformin, and other metabolic modulators in the role of treatment of PAH and right heart failure. Now, many of these studies have been stopped, they've been underpowered, um, and the results are still pending, and we'll come back to how we want to address that. So it's clear that altered myocardial metabolism is definitely a hallmark of this maladaptive phenotype, but work done by, Dun uh, by Duncan Stewart and his lab has shown that you can actually recapitulate this with just with different animal strains. Uh, and we use rats uh, in, our, uh, in our animal models and uh, uh, a strain of fisher rats has a very poor prognosis in the Sujin hypoxia model. In fact, these animals have severe RV dysfunction and dilatation and a 100% mortality at five weeks. And yet the Sprague Dolly rats, when subjected to the same conditions with the same degree of pulmonary hypertension, had survival rates of more than 88% beyond nine weeks. And so we collaborated with Duncan, and we looked at um, oxidative metabolism with C11 PET imaging in these two different strains. And we demonstrated that in the Fisher strain, the, the, the strain associated with this maladaptive phenotype, they actually had an increase in oxidative metabolism, but this came at the cost of reduced RV power and reduced RV efficiency. And they, when they looked at this work further, they demonstrated really nicely that, in fact, adenylate kinase 1 was one of the top 10 different differentially expressed genes between the fissures and the Sujin models. And now, as you know, um, this, this protein is very important in transferring energy out of the mitochondria into the contractile apparatus. And these animals who were deficient in this, um, in this gene um, were just unable to shuttle the ATP appropriately, and this probably contributed uh, to their maladaptive phenotype. Now, Duncan collaborated with some folks in Quebec City and actually got some RV tissue to look at this in compensated and decompensated right heart failure. And in fact, what he demonstrated really nicely was that AT AK1 protein expression was actually reduced relative to normals, um, uh, but it was increased in the compensated RV failure relative to decompensated RV failure. There was also this marked reduction in the CK pathway. And so the theory is that as we that that in states of health we shuttle the ATP uh, out of the mitochondria using the CK pathway, but in states of disease that pathway is suppressed, and we rely perhaps on the AK1 pathway for shuttling this protein or this energy. And if we're unable to do that, then this potentially could contribute to this maladaptive phenotype. So really exciting work by Duncan and his group, which suggests again a potential target of treatment for uh, mal preventing or treating maladaptive remodeling. We looked at a number of other proteomic screens in these two in these two strain genetically diverse strains of animals, and we also saw differential expression of a lot of different neuronal proteins that are related in nerve growth, synaptic pla and synaptic plasticity. And this is a big interest of mine because I, ultimately I spend most of my time treating left heart failure. And we know that neurohormonal activation is the most important foundation of treatment in left heart failure. But we also know that those same sympathetic uh, and neurohormonal pathways that are um, so important to the uh, survival and then the progression of heart failure in left heart also occur in right heart failure. And so it's very exciting to wonder whether or not some of these pathways can be leveraged as treatments in right heart failure. Now, we've also looked at 
in vivo sympathetic activity with PET imaging. And this was using HED. Now, as you may know, HED is an analog of norepinephrine. And increased sympathetic activity is associated with decreased HED retention due to rapid washout due to this accentuated release in, from the synaptic cleft. And we sh showed in patients with right heart failure, in fact, that HED um, retention was associated with RV failure and worse prognosis. But we really wanted to understand a little bit more about sympathetic activity and treatment in, um, in right heart failure. And we chose to look at uh, the effect of beta blockers in right heart failure, a very controversial subject with lots of mixed results. And we used the Sujin hypoxia model um, of, uh, of pulmonary arterial hypertension. And these animals were given carvedilol starting at week five. So after the establishment uh, of right heart failure and PAH, a clinically relevant time point. And in fact, what we saw was no difference in survival. Carvedilol had no effect on the pulmonary hypertension severity, which is what we expected. But we failed to demonstrate that carvedilol had any benefit on resuscitating reverse RV remodeling. In fact, certainly the, the animals who had PAH had much worse RV function and greater RV mass than the control animals, but there was no differential effect on RV remodeling or LV size or function uh, in carvedilol treated animals relative to vehicle controls. We saw really nicely, and this is work I should say, by the way, all of and much of this work was done uh, by my MD PhD student, former MD PhD student, Jason Zelt, who is a resident right now, and um, really had uh, really great insight into this and wanted to look at the concept of ventricular interdependence and the effect of the LV on RV failure. And he really nicely showed that as your pulmonary hypertension severity increased, uh, in fact, your LV function decreased and your eccentricity our shape and relationship of the RV to LV became more and more abnormal. And we see this all the time in our clinical patients. Now, what Jason also demonstrated is that carvedilol had no effect on RV sympathetic activity. We used HED imaging to look at sympathetic activity on the right ventricle. But what we did see was that carvedilol actually had an effect on the LV, that it was able to reduce sympathetic activity. And we demonstrated that by demonstrating an increase in HED volume of distribution and reduced washout of the LV, all suggesting that there was an effect on the left ventricle. So why was there no effect on the right ventricle? Well, in fact, what Jason demonstrated was progressive sympathetic denervation in the right ventricle, such that the worse your pulmonary hypertension was, the less, uh, the more denervation you had in the right ventricle. And he really nicely showed a tight relationship between HED activity, measuring sympathetic activity with PET, and pH severity um, with immune histochemical evidence of sympathetic innervation. Uh, and there was progressive and selective denervation in the RV with much less effect on the LV free wall. So certainly this data, I think, is very interesting and shows our ability to use, again, non-invasive imaging like PET uh, to help to quantify the burden of the denervated myocardium in the right ventricle. But this is also precisely why the beta blocker may have had no effect on the failing right ventricle. And it really suggests the importance of timing when we talk about initiation of therapies, that there may become a point um, and, uh, uh, where, where treatment with things like beta blockers will pose all risk and no benefit, as we saw in our animals. Now, interestingly, we didn't see any relationship between parasympathetic nerve density and PAH severity. So the parasympathetic nerve fibers were essentially spared. So if we look at potential treatment targets for right heart failure, perhaps augmentation of parasympathetic uh, activity may be of benefit. Now, we're, of course, not the only people interested in this idea, and there's so many different clinical trials being done or sort of preclinical trials being done targeting different levels of the neurohormonal signaling pathway. And again, as we've seen with metabolic modulation, the shift or push from the preclinical side to the clinical side is actually very small. But it's not just um, metabolic, uh, it's not just neurohormonal uh, therapies that are being, um, being looked at. Um, people are also looking at non-pharmacological treatments uh, for potentially treatment of PIH and right heart failure. And this includes animal studies that have done sympathetic ganglion block, renal denervation, and even vagal nerve stimulation, as per our early dis our discussion a few minutes ago. And all of which in animal models have been shown to reduce PIH severity and RV function. But so 
far, the only one that actually has been able to be translated to clinical studies is pulmonary artery denervation. And this was a very small non-blinded cohort study that did suggest an improvement in exercise capacity and pH severity, as well as disease progression uh, with pulmonary artery denervation. So people are still, again, there's interest in this, but we have a long way to go and a lot to learn. So I'd like to shift a little bit from the experimental to the established and talk a little bit about how we currently treat pulmonary arterial hypertension now. And we recognize that there are three fundamental pathways or targets that are used in our standard regimen for treating pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, we're gonna un we understand that these pathways primarily target the pulmonary vasculature. We do not have any therapies that can directly and selectively treat the RV, but of course, you would imagine that the RV function will improve if you can reduce the RV afterload in pulmonary hypertension. And there are currently over 10 therapies approved for use of PAH in Canada. And yet, despite this, there's really little consensus on what the most effective treatment or combination of treatments should be. And I had the opportunity to work with um, some collaborators uh, from Western Ontario to undertake this systematic review and network meta-analysis. And we looked at drugs that are currently approved or, um, or invest novel investigational drugs in clinical trials for pulmonary arterial hypertension. We looked at about 53 randomized trials. It represented over 10,000 patients. And we, we demonstrated that all drugs had some effect or improvement on meaningful clinical endpoints. But interestingly, the degree of that clinical effect or the certainty of benefit was actually quite variable across different drugs and different combinations. And so there was, again, very little to suggest that there was a leading drug or combination that would most affect all or the majority of important uh, outcomes for our PAH patients. So how do we put this together and explain this to our community and to our patients? Well, we tried to do that um, in this recent position statement that I, I had the opportunity to co-chair, which really talked a little bit uh, about the clinical diagnosis and management of this disease. But more recently, in the last six months, the uh, updated guidelines for pulmonary hypertension came out, and they revised the concept of this risk-based approach to pulmonary hypertension, such that if you have suggestions of high risk, and I'll tell you that all of those risk-based features almost all reflect back on the failing right ventricle, that you can then appropriately determine what and how many therapies you should offer your pulmonary arterial hypertension patient. But if you just take a step back and look over time, you can see that the recommendations for treatment of pulmonary hypertension have changed very substantially over the last 10 years. And we've had multiple iterations of different guidelines and position statements. And we've shifted from not even treating patients with mild disease to treating aggressively all types of disease and using this risk-based approach to help to refine the best treatment strategy. And so Jason Zelt, my, um, my former PhD MD student, wanted to look and see how these changes in management have affected outcome over time. Now, we were able to do this because we could leverage something we created in 2015, which is a Canadian pulmonary hypertension registry, and that registry is ongoing. And we used data from our clinic and well and collaborated with our colleagues in Vancouver and Calgary to come up with a cohort of approximately 400 treatment naive incident PAH patients from expanding along from a, a long period of time from 2004 to 2021. And what we demonstrated was that absolutely um, there were changes in management over time. And Jason showed very nicely that uh, with different iterations of the guidelines, and we took the last two iterations of the guidelines, we saw a more aggressive approach to the treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension. But unfortunately, what we didn't see is improvement in survival over time. So despite the fact that we were being more aggressive because the guidelines told us to. Our one year and five year survival from 2015 to 2019 were exactly the same as our cohort from before 2015, with that still unfortunate median five year survival of just 58%. Now, patients didn't present differently in the more contemporary cohort. The risk based assessment and the functional class was very similar over time. 
And uh, when you compare survival, one, three, and five-year survival in our uh, Canadian uh, data, it looks very, very similar to other international U.S. and European registries that have been published on the same topic. And in fact, if you start early on, and this goes over time from early generation registries, you see the biggest improvement or gains in survival happened more than 20 years ago. And that was with the advent of IV process cycling therapy. And since then, things have fallen off. Now, there was no subgroup that showed a benefit uh, or survival benefit over time, including older patients, male patients, and different subgroups of PAH that are associated with worse prognosis. So the question is, why are we seeing this? Is it that we're lacking therapies um, that can reliably affect mortality? Or is it that we just don't have the right tools yet to select who's going to develop this maladaptive phenotype and be at greatest risk? Now, there are many different ways we can classify risk in pulmonary arterial hypertension. And so what Jason Zelt did is he looked at these different risk uh, categories and wanted to see how they would perform in our cohort of PAH patients. And in fact, all these different risk scores did reliably predict prognosis in our cohort of PH patients here in Ottawa, with the reveal score being probably the most effective, largely because it involves the most number of parameters, also the more, most complicated to do. But when you look in our data, and our cohort, you can see in the yellow, those are what you would call intermediate risk patients. And the far majority of our patients being seen are intermediate risk. And these are the patients that are actually the hardest to manage because there's the least amount of evidence to support treatment decisions. And in this intermediate risk cohort, in fact, depending on what score you were using, you could reclassify 30, 50 to 70% of these patients to either a higher or lower risk cohort. So it actually makes it very difficult to make decisions. So we wanted to look to see if there was a way we could refine the risk associated with this intermediate group. And one of the parameters that was great interest to our group was that of renal function. As a clinician, we all appreciate that Renal dysfunction is one of the most important markers of prognosis in, in heart failure. And, and when we applied renal, different markers of renal dysfunction, whether it was CKD stage or change in renal function, we saw in our PAH cohort that we could very much substantially um, identify worse prognosis. And in fact, when we applied renal, uh, re renal function into our intermediate risk cohort, we saw that all of a sudden we could discriminate our intermediate risk cohort from good survival to very poor survival just by adding in renal function. And so what Jason did really, really quite brilliantly is he used a stepwise multivariate Cox regression analysis to build a model to incorporate all the different important parameters of risk in our PAH patients. And he ended up identifying four parameters that were the most predictive of outcome, male sex, impaired GFR, mixed venous oxygen saturation, and a six minute walk test. And he was able to apply weighting to each of those variables based on the strength of their beta regression coefficient. And he came up with what he called the Ottawa PAH score. And using these simple four parameters, we were able in our derivation cohort to show very nice discrimination of risk. Now, he actually was able to validate his work in an external cohort when we use the Calgary data set. And in fact, what he demonstrated was that the, um, the ability to predict risk in four simple variables was as good as the very complicated reveal uh, score that had the best uh, ROC analysis. Now, the problem with our risk score is it required an invasive measurement of mixed venous oxygen saturation. And that is not very practical when we're assessing our patients in follow-up because we don't typically do right heart cats routinely. And we were unable to develop a non-invasive parameter of that because we had limitations with NT-Pro BNP. We weren't the only one thinking about this. In fact, um, we were scooped by the reveal team that then came up after our publication on renal function with the reveal to light calculator. And this incorporated renal function and also nt pro BNP. So a really nice non-invasive measure or, or scale to help to refine risk. So we've clearly come a long way in our understanding of risks and mechanisms that contribute to this maladaptive phenotype in right heart failure. But right heart failure continues to be, as I said, the most common cause of death for our PAH patients. And we still have a long way to go in helping to move new therapies along and personalize therapies for our patients.
But we're also learning that a big part of what we do um, involves engaging the patients. And what matters to our patients is a really important question. And I had the opportunity to work with Jason Weatherald on this project. And this was his uh, pro uh, project that he did. Uh, and it's called and it, with a James Lind Alliance Priority Setting pro uh, Partnership. And what we did is we were able to send a large number of questions out to our patient and our family care uh, caregivers through PHA Canada. And he received about 200, just under 300 responses. And he asked these uh, patients, what's important to you in the next generation of PH research? And through a very formative, uh, uh, iterative process, he was able to identify uh, what looked like uh, just under 200 priority questions. We then went to the literature and kept the questions that were not yet answered by the literature. And then we resent out surveys, reprioritize those questions, and eventually came up with 30 priority questions that in a final workshop, we brought down to 10 priority questions. These are the top 10 questions that are important to our patients uh, and our patient caregivers. And as you can see on the list, number four is right heart failure. And so it does matter to our patients. And there are so many potential targets of therapy or pathways of interest in right ventricular failure. Now, some of these candidates are already in the pipeline, but how we prioritize and study these options remains a challenge. And uh, in addition, there are really uh, important limitations to phase three clinical trials of RV failure in pulmonary arterial hypertension. We've really seen a shift in the design of RCTs over time in PAH from surrogate endpoints, short-term trials to long, uh, longer duration trials with, with clinical, clinically meaningful endpoints. But that's hard to do when you have a relatively rare disease such as PAH. It's also hard to do when you have a very heterogeneous disease such as right heart failure. And as I've shown you today, along the path of investigation, there's been multiple failures. These therapies have a high failure rate, inconclusive results, often underpowered. So there's got to be a better way, perhaps, to study the next generation of candidate drugs in right heart failure. And there are many different alternative trial designs that you can consider, including the concept of phenotyping or enriching patient populations by selecting patients who are either mechanistically or phenotypically most likely to respond to a particular drug. And that certainly can accelerate investigation at the cost, of course, of generalizability. But there's also this very interesting concept of an adaptive platform trial. And as the name implies, a key feature of an adaptive trial is that the design can be modified during the trial in response to accumulating information for the purposes of maximizing efficiency and achieving better outcomes for our patients. Now, essentially, you have a master protocol that serves as a foundation for multiple different arms. You can have a unified control group and share that information across different interventions that can can be added on. You can have um, operational efficiency increase through common screening, common data collection, and you can use this concept of adaptive randomization, which allows randomization ratios to be shifted or altered to more to better allocate patients to therapies that have more promise, thereby accelerating knowledge translation. And the COVID pandemic really posed a challenge for all of us who do clinical research about how slow research can take place and it really offered opportunity uh, to create new, new ways of doing things. And this um, really a uh, great review done by Patrick Lawler um, showed how the, he and his group used adaptive trials to investigate the role of anticoagulation in patients admitted with COVID. And they were able to combine three clinical trials on this topic, the ATT&CK trial, ACTIVE4, and the REMAP-PAP trial into one universal platform trial. And they used monthly adaptive analyses to evaluate sort of pre-specified groups based on futility or stopping triggers based on biomarkers and how well they were doing. And enabling this, they were able to come to an answer first in critically ill patients and then in non-critically ill patients much faster than if these, if these three trials were proceeding in parallel.
So is it possible that we could develop an adaptive clinical trial uh, in right heart failure? Now, if we're going to undertake an, uh, a big uh, initiative like this, we certainly require tremendous collaboration and infrastructure. And I've been very lucky to work uh, our group with uh, the um, newly created CHF Alliance led by Dr. Jean Rouleau. And this is an incredible network of, of experts, patients, caregivers, uh, and other interested people in heart failure. And they have four national teams and a number of important priority projects. But one of Dr. Rouleau's important priority projects is the right heart. And he's established the RV network of networks, which integrates essentially um, people interested in pediatrics, congenital heart disease, and of course, pulmonary hypertension and heart failure doctors like us to work together to think of new therapies and understanding of right heart failure. And Dr. Rouleau has been, and, and Duncan Stewart have been very, very supportive and instrumental in helping to get this initiative uh, off the ground. This initiative is a brainchild of my colleague, Dr. Jason Weatherall. And essentially, we're developing what we call the Canadian RV Adaptive Platform Network, or CRAVE. And our overall aim is essentially to launch and build a multi dimensional platform that will allow us to test new therapies in RV failure across a spectrum of conditions of, of right heart failure failure, probably starting with pulmonary arterial hypertension, but you can envision that other cohorts of right heart failure could also be brought in and incorporated to look and see how these different investigational therapies would perform. And so, as I say, I have the opportunity to co-lead this with Jason Weatherall, and along with Duncan Stewart, who was uh, essential with working with John Rouleau and getting the uh, the uh, network off the ground. And we've recently engaged uh, 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 Patrick Lawler as a co-investigator on this as well, who is essentially one of the world's geniuses in adaptive trials. Now, we are in the process of engaging a lot of important stakeholders, stakeholders uh, that in, uh, in methods, stakeholders uh, in, uh, in imaging and other biomarkers, obviously heart failure and pH stakeholders, and of course, patients and patient support groups. And we've recently just submitted a, a CIHR planning and dissemination grant, and we're hoping if funded, we'll have our first meeting this fall. And important in this meeting is the uh, recognition of diversity and inclusion. And so we have experts like Dr. King, who've been engaged, who will teach us about how we can engage our Indigenous patient population. We uh, importantly, uh, as it relates to treatment of heart failure, uh, we want to engage individuals and patient partners from rural and remote communities. And this uh, meeting will be co-led by my colleague, Jamie Mira, who is our executive director for PHA Canada, and we'll have patients and patient family members at this meeting as well. Now, another important goal for Jason and I is to develop a platform that potentially has harmonization uh, internationally. And in fact, we've engaged a number of different individuals from different institutions across the across the globe who have expertise, not just in pulmonary hypertension, but in adaptive trial design and heart failure, um, who are also interested in similar ideas. And we're hoping that uh, some of them will be able to come to our meeting and will work towards international harmonization. So we're still very early on in the timeline. We've just recently completed an environmental scan um, uh, to help identify uh, priorities, endpoint priorities of interest for RV failure trials. Um, we're also in the process of doing a systematic review uh, on RV failure, uh, on treat uh, treatments for RV failure, and engaging our stakeholders and organizing our governance and team met, uh, team members. Um, we essentially have what we believe four sort of phases. We're just early on in the pre-planning phase, but we hope to launch this meeting in the fall. And the goal, of course, then would be to have our first uh, large CIHR application within a year, and within a year and a half, potentially launch our first experimental program protocol through this platform. So that's where we are in terms of kind of where we've been and uh, and where we're going. I've taken you on a long journey from the bench uh, to hopefully a platform uh, in the last 30 minutes. And I hope I've shown you that there really have been a number of insights and, and, uh, and uh, knowledge gained in how the RV adapts or doesn't adapt in right heart failure. 
Um, but a lot of this work has been done in isolation. And so there are a lot of really important questions that still remain. How do all of these dysregulated pathways work in synergy or in opposition to promote disease or prevent right heart failure? And, and as we saw in our beta blocker study, um, how important uh, uh, is disease stage or tissue specificity in some of these adaptive or maladaptive processes? Um, now, I've shown you a lot of work where we've been been able to use in vivo PET imaging and integrated imaging into our into our um, our analysis, and I think that PET imaging and other biomarkers are out there that have significant potential uh, to help us to understand not just mechanisms of disease, but the personalization or the precision of the treatment of right heart failure uh, across uh, across wide cohorts. And we're hoping that this platform trial that we want to build will not only allow us to test new therapies in early phase two, but also will help us to build and grow our database so that we can better personalize and leverage some of this knowledge. And so I'll stop there and thanks for your time. And I just want to acknowledge all the amazing people that I've been lucky enough to work with. Predominantly, again, I'll, I'll just uh, shout out to Jason Zelt uh, because a lot of the work that, that I've shown you today has really been led at, uh, by him. But I'd also like to just recognize that this collaboration that we've been able to build comes from across Canada. Uh, so my PH colleagues have been uh, just, just phenomenal in helping uh, to share knowledge and move things along, particularly um, my co-lead, uh, Jason Weatherald, in our our Crave project and internally the mentorship that I've received from, from Duncan Stewart as well from Rob Beanlands uh, and all the other people that have uh, helped on all the dimensions of work uh, that we've done and particularly our patients who are always willing to undergo uh, uh, new and investigational ideas. So thanks so much and happy to take questions. Well, fantastic, Lisa. You know, that really actually goes from bench to bedside, but to really uh, incorporating a lot of very exciting, you know, novel approaches, right, you know, to solve this problem. And I think, uh, you know, similarly to the uh, meeting on rare disease that was uh, uh, taking place last Friday, you know, in uh, previously, uh, the thinking is that, uh, you know, it's not possible to actually do trials for more rare condition, but in fact, that's being challenged at the moment. And I think this is a great example of that. And uh, so um, I certainly have uh, lots of uh, Questions, but I don't know if there are, are questions from the room here. Um, but uh, you know, Jim Robley has uh, posed the questions. Thanks, Jim, and uh, tremendous session. You know, so thanks very much uh, to Lisa's uh, uh, excellent uh, presentation. So the question is: Often we use milrinone in uh, anesthesia to improve right heart function uh, in acute uh, setting. Is there any research supporting this? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. I think that's a that's a great question, and it's one of the phenotypes of right heart failure that needs a lot of study. So a lot of the work that I've done has been in chronic right heart failure. It's been sort of chronic established right heart failure. The whole phenotype of acute heart failure in general, as Peter can tell you better than anyone, is an enigma. Right? We have so we have really no evidence based therapies that are going to help us with acute heart failure, even acute left heart failure. So we we definitely don't have good evidence for acute right heart heart failure beyond a few different um, me uh, methods uh, that Dr. Robley, I'm sure, knows very well, of course, and others. Um, so, you know, reducing RV afterload, um, things like inhaled nitric oxide have been studied, inhaled pulmonary vasodilators have been studied in a not very scientifically rigorous format, but have shown some benefit. Um, there's lots of data to support temporary su to supportive devices in right heart failure. That's a, an aside. As it relates to inotropic therapy uh, in acute right heart failure, there is no good evidence to suggest this. But I think we here in Ottawa would, would be really well poised uh, to, to do a very pragmatic trial similar to has been done uh, in the critical care environment, uh, looking at, um, looking at uh, uh, RV targeted therapies in acute RV failure in the post-op CSIC you, right? Because there are really three things we can do. We can, we can reduce their preload or control their preload. We can increase their anatropy or their contractility, and we can reduce their afterload. And there's little evidence to support any of that, but physiologically, it makes sense. Uh, and you could, you can really nicely envision a, um, a, a platform or an approach uh, testing different mechanisms or different ways to do, uh, to affect one of those three things um, uh, to see whether or not you have a benefit in outcomes. And I know Luis 
Sun, who um, has is, is, is down in Stanford, has taken an interest in this, and she's published some work looking at RV biomarkers uh, uh, of failure in the early post-op setting. So, you know, easily this is a great place to build on some of that work. Yeah, I just want to uh, second that, you know, Louise actually developed, uh, you know, certainly predictors because this is really a very common problem, right? And I think time has come and uh, as well illustrated by your, uh, uh, you know, a platform design that we really need to tackle this problem, you know, uh, much more systematically. And I think the conclusion, even from the rare disease meeting as well, uh, is the fact that uh, you need to actually approach this in a systematic fashion, start with a trial and you can collect the information, learn from it, rather than kind of just doing the random things in which, you know, we yeah. always end up where we started. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah so exactly. I think that's a, uh, that's yeah. a really a great uh, consistent yeah. theme. Are there other questions? Because I have two questions. One is that uh, I guess a more uh, philosophical or teleological um, is that, uh, the fact that the RV, you know, you start out by, uh, you know, sort of challenging our thinking that uh, the response of RV is actually quite uh, heterogeneous, right? You know, there are ones who actually do very well versus others who don't. Um, how much is this uh, etiological dri uh, driven uh, versus speed of onset of a challenge uh, versus uh, you think there are genetics, you yeah. know, to this, you know, so because, uh, yeah, it, it's interesting. At the moment, you have a heterogeneity, right? Yeah. You know, it really actually suggests that uh, there are some uh, key determinants. Yeah, right? that, and, and yeah. there is, and and you know, it's interesting when when this concept of maladaptive remodeling, um, is sort of people start talking about this adaptive versus maladaptive remodeling. I would say less than ten years ago, um, everybody thought that they that they knew exactly what it was that flipped the switch, uh, and so everyone was working in their labs looking at their switch, and 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 then what we saw is that it's very, very complicated. And it's more than just one switch. And that was sort of what I was getting at, Peter. We don't actually know what the main driver is. I still think ischemia is a big yes. part of the downstream consequences that happen, certainly with, with metabolism. Um, but neurohormonal regulation is important. Uh, you know, but, but you, you can't ignore what's being done in, 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 in regards to the mitochondria and, and all the effects of the, of the, of, uh, of, uh, of the, the, the mitochondria. So I don't, know what the one switch is there is a vulnerability there you know i think duncan's work that he did in his uh, fisher uh fisher um spray dolly strains was really compelling right because it really showed and i don't think it's all about um you know uh atp shuffling out of the mitochondria it's not but it does show you that if you do have one failure of of reprogramming um you will then have a cascade event and that so as we go forward, we need to talk to each other and our different mechanisms, and we need to kind of understand how these things are interacting, you know, the proteomic work and the, um, um, the metabolic profiling that I showed early in the talk, this is all published in the last six months. And it's super interesting. But what we don't know, are, are what does this actually mean? Yes. It, does this mean that if you have this uh, profile that you are more that you are that this is the failure this is the downstream consequence of your failure of adaptation or was it this profile that helped to prevent you from further adaptation so one of the things we really need to do is phenotype across the spectrum right we we need to understand and i know people are doing this and the pv pvd omics project is an incredible project and we'll hopefully do this but we need to understand the disease at different stages of the disease because just like uh, we saw with our animal models in, in, in right heart failure, there is a window here where things will change. We see that, I think, with um with with the with meta with metabolism right um there's a window where you know where your 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 fatty acids are uh, uptake increases and then decrease and then may increase again so what's the right window for treatment if you're going to use a fatty acid oxidation window so to answer your question I don't think we know what the main driver is I think it's I think it's multiple I think there's multiple footprints to understand and what we lack are two things one how these potential switches work together and also how they how they roll out temporarily when you go from you know from zero to end stage heart failure uh, because I think I think they different pathways are up and down regulated uh, over time. Yes, yeah, so I do actually see just from the readouts and things like that. There's a parallel between what we're seeing in HEF, HEF work and the RV work. Yeah. And so 
and uh, now we're learning that uh, you know uh, markers like IGFPP7, yeah. you know, so uh, uh, inch uh, pointing two and things like that. There are actually markers of uh, microvascular, uh, you know, sort of uh, yeah. integrity. Yeah. And uh, so I think this is probably also playing a yeah. role, as a hint by uh, what you uh, mentioned earlier. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, you know, be great to uh, collaborate and uh, you yeah, know, so, so well, thank fantastic. You. Yeah. So uh, with that, uh, just so I could thank uh, Dr. Lisa Milonchuk again. You know, so for really actually a fantastic, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, really uh, indicating you know where we've been from a, a horizon point of view, but also in terms of you know where we can go uh, in terms of the ability to actually address this uh, you know very very thoughtful manner. Yeah. So thank, thank you, you so much and thank uh, you all the best and thanks so much for joining us. Take care.